Good evening. I'm Jesse Berger, founder and artistic director of Red Bull Theater. Thank you for being with us for the first part of Othello 2020. Red Bull Theater is committed to helping realize a more just American theater. This series is part of our commitment to racial justice and ensuring that our theater is a home for all. All month long, with Shakespeare's Othello as our launching point, we invite you to join us as we explore the intersection of race and classical theater. Together we'll ask, what does Othello mean for us in 2020? For complete details about all our Othello 2020 programs, please visit us at redbulltheater.com. Finally, all of our fall 2020 programs are free but this is only possible with the support of people like you. Please consider making a tax deductible donation today in support of this program and Red Bull Theater's commitment to the vitality of classical theater. And now I'll hand it over to our Associate Artistic Director, Nathan Winkelstein, who will get us started with a remarkable conversation exploring Iago with the extraordinary Patrick Page. Hello, and thank you all for joining us tonight, whether on YouTube, Facebook, or our website. I am Nathan Winkelstein, the Associate Artistic Director of Red Bull Theater and host of tonight's remarkable Podversations. For those of you joining us for the first time, these are informal conversations designed to provide insight into how great classical performers approach character and text. Part of that informal discussion is you. If you're watching this on YouTube or on Facebook, you can type any questions you might have that come up from our conversation or for Patrick Page in the chat functions and we will see them on here. We can't promise we'll get to all of them, but we'll get to as many as we can. This is an open conversation, so please do engage with us. This evening's conversation will focus on the iconic villain Iago from Shakespeare's masterpiece, Othello, with a special emphasis on the soliloquy at the end of act one, scene three. Our guest tonight played this role at Shakespeare Theatre Company in 2005 opposite Avery Brooks as Othello. He is a Drama Desk and Tony nominee and is recognized as one of America's preeminent Shakespeare practitioners. And, of course, most importantly, he is a Red Bull Theatre regular, appearing most recently in our 2016 production of Coriolanus, as well as numerous readings and a recent one-night-only presentation of his one-man play, all the Devils Are Here, in which Iago features prominently. He is, of course, the great Patrick Page. Hi, Patrick. Hi. How are you, Nathan? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Thank you. I'm for great. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Of course. Well, I think that everyone's going to be eager both to hear you read and to get into the discussion. So I want to just uh, keep driving and give a little bit of context for the bit you're going to read for us. Um, this speech is spoken by Iago to the audience. It is a soliloquy just after he has convinced Rodrigo to sell all of his land for money so that he has the means to woo Desdemona, Othello's new wife. In this speech, Iago states his feelings about Othello and begins to foment a plan to destroy Othello's new lieutenant Cassio, his new wife Desdemona, and Othello himself. Thus do I ever make my fool my purse. For I mine own gain knowledge should profane if I would time expend with such a snipe but for my sport and profit. I hate the more. And it is thought abroad that twixt my sheets he's done my office, I know not if it be true. But I for mere suspicion in that kind will do as if for surety. He holds me well, the better shall my purpose work on him. Cassio's a proper man, let me see now. To get his place and to plume up my will, a double knavery, how, how, let me see. <laughs> After some time to abuse it. His ear that Cassio's too familiar with his wife? Yet the person at a smooth disposed to be suspected, framed to make women false. The more is of a free and open nature that thinks men honest that but seem to be so. 
and will as tenderly be led by the nose as asses are. I have it. It is engendered. Hell and night must bring this monstrous birth to the world's light. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. This is such a, um, it's such a foreboding speech. You know, I was rereading the entire play when uh, in preparation for this and, and your choice of doing this speech. And it does feel like if this was a modern day, if Shakespeare was a modern day TV writer, there would be kind of a bump, bump, bump commercial break. Uh, right there with that well, in fact, at the end of this speech, there's a clap of thunder because the storm at Cyprus begins. There's a literal clap of thunder in the theater at the end of this speech in the production, in any production of the play. Yeah. Well, there, there you go. He's, uh, um, <laughs> um, you, so you did this role in 2005 at Shakespeare Theatre Company and that was under the direction of, of Michael Kahn, right? Yes. Um, how, can you give us just a little bit of how that production was and do you, that's 15 years ago now, um, a little bit about what you chose about Iago in that production and perhaps what might change if you did it again today? Uh, well, really, it's more what changed from the, the time I'd played him previously. I think the time I'd played him previously, what I lacked was a, a specific psychological diagnosis for him. Um, and so I went down, uh, I think, a, a, a wrong path. I'd been, uh, I had a lovely director, Libby Apple, but I, I feel that I didn't, uh, I, I didn't do Iago any justice in that production, which was, I think, around 1988 or 89, when Michael and I did it in 2005, uh, he asked me to do it. Actually, it was, it was quite daring of him because he, he asked me if I would play Iago on the opening night of uh, Macbeth before the curtain went up. He's quite cunning, that Michael Kahn. So he, he, he dangled it in front of me right before I went on stage to play Macbeth for opening night. Uh, I thought it was brave of him because he, he didn't know yet how my Macbeth would be received. So to offer me the role before, uh, the, before the reviews came in and before the audience had rendered their judgment, I thought was pretty brave. And at the time, I wasn't excited to play it at all. It wasn't a role that excited me because I felt I'd had a failure in it and I felt I really didn't know my way around it. When I say a failure, I mean a personal failure. I, I think, frankly, the, the role is actor-proof. I think it's impossible to fail in the role for an audience. It's so well-written that no matter how poorly the actor plays him, he's, he's likely going to run away with the play to Othello's detriment. And especially if Thiago is larks about and plays for a lot of comedy, I think it can do the Othello a lot of damage. But... Um, but Michael began a year before the first rehearsal with a single question. And the question was, is Iago a psychopath? And I didn't know because I didn't know what a psychopath was. And so I began my, essentially my graduate program in psychopathy and sociopathy for the next year. I read everything I could find on the subject, uh, all of the, clinical materials and, and all of the materials that are written for lay people. And um, I happened to start with this book here, which is called The Sociopath Next Door by Martha Stout. Uh, people get a bit mixed up with the term sociopath and psychopath, and I, I did as well. In fact, I didn't know when I started the difference between psychopathic and psychotic. For example, in Hitchcock's film, Psycho, what are they referring to? What, what mental condition are they referring to when they say Psycho? I didn't know. So I began to study. Um, the shortcut is that when, when in 1972, when Dr. Robert Hare first made a checklist to diagnose the condition that's known in the, um, by the American Psychiatric Association as antisocial personality disorder, psychopath and sociopath are not clinical terms. Uh, APD is the clinical term, and then there are, uh, are, are variations on it. 
Um, but when, when it was first uh, really diagnosed in 1972, which is, you know, yesterday, um, the words were used interchangeably and, and, were, and were for a couple of decades used interchangeably. Now there tends to be some consensus among some, some clinicians that psychopathy is a neurological condition which one is born with where what uh, and and we'll discuss what the person what the, the condition um at, whereas sociopathy it, it has a neurological component but is also it, it is is triggered by extreme trauma so anyway i started with this book uh, in trauma in childhood of course um I started with this book and it was a great book to start with for an actor. It was just a complete accident of fate that I found this book. And the reason it was a wonderful accident of fate is because it began with a thought experiment where the author, uh, Martha Stout, was asking the reader to imagine themselves inside the mind of the psychopath. And of course, that's what the actor does, is think of the character from the inside out. So I'm going to read it to you now. And as I do, I think you can see if you can imagine this for yourself, if you can apply this to yourself. So this is what she writes. Imagine if you can, not having a conscience, none at all. No feeling of guilt or remorse, no matter what you do. No limiting sense of concern for the well-being of strangers friends, or even family members. Imagine no struggles with shame or guilt, not a single one in your whole life, no matter what kind of selfish, lazy, harmful, or immoral action you've taken. Pretend that the concept of responsibility is unknown to you, except as a burden others seem to accept without question, like gullible fools. Now, add to this strange fantasy the ability to conceal from other people that your psychological makeup is radically different from theirs. Since everyone simply assumes that conscience is universal among human beings, hiding the fact that you are conscience-free is nearly effortless. You're not held back from any of your desires by guilt or shame. And you are never confronted by others for your cold-bloodedness. The ice water in your veins is so bizarre so completely outside their personal experience that they seldom even guess at your condition. In other words, you are completely free of internal restraints and your unhampered liberty to do just as you please with no pangs of conscience is conveniently invisible from the world. You can do anything at all. That's a psychopath. That's a sociopath. That is a superpower, really. A person who's psychopathic or sociopathic will not present themselves for care because they don't suffer. They think everyone else suffers from a malady, a malady called conscience, empathy, guilt, shame. But the psychopath himself does not suffer. Now, the only time that that may be called into question and some suffering might happen because it is, after all, a kind, a, it, well, I shouldn't say after all, it is a form of malignant narcissism, narcissism being at the root of the condition. Uh, and so the time the person suffers is when there is an injury to the narcissistic image that he has built for himself. And Shakespeare is unbelievably acute in the psychology of this because he begins with the injury. And the injury is not being promoted. And the injury is Othello marrying Desdemona without him having known anything about it. Remember, Iago fancies himself Othello's closest confidant, closest friend, and he's been exiled as Lucifer was exiled by God. And there are lots of um, allusions to Lucifer and to the story of the fall of Lucifer in Othello. So that narcissistic injury, now what does the person then have to do? They have to rebuild their sense of themselves as all-powerful, which is what Iago sets about to do. Um, the checklist that Dr. Robert Hare created to diagnose the condition 
I'll read part of the checklist Please. to you now. And you can see if it applies to Iago. And along the way, you might see if it applies to anyone else you might recognize. Pathological lying. Check. Glib and superficial charm. Check. Grandiose self of sense of self. Check. Cunning and manipulative. Check. Lack of respect remorse or guilt, check. Lack of empathy, check. Parasitic lifestyle. This entire scene is comes after he's working Rodrigo to get more of his money out of him, check. Now, any three of those would probably indicate sociopathy or psychopathy. Iago has them all. So it's an unbelievably precise portrait of a sociopath. Now, once you know that, playing the part, the role unfolds itself in front of you. Uh, and all of your decisions come from that place. So I began studying known psychopaths. I studied in depth biographies of Ted Bundy, of uh, Dennis Rader, the BTK killer, of Charles Ridgway, the Green River killer. Uh, of of G Gordon uh, G Gordon Liddy, and all of those in all of those biographies, there were details that were unbelievably useful to me in creating Iago. And when you look at this speech, uh, one thing you didn't mention about the speech is it's Iago's first soliloquy of seven. And up to this point, he's spoken almost entirely in prose. And suddenly he switches to verse, not just verse, but an unbelievably metrical verse. By metrical, if you're listening, Shakespeare writes in blank verse what some people call iambic pentameter. I am being a, a, a sound that goes da dumb and then pentameter, right? So you've got, thus do I ever make my fool my purse quite regular, except for just the first foot. Thus do I ever make my fool my purse. Now, that's the first thing he's doing is disabusing the audience of what they may be thinking, which is that I actually care about Rodrigo at all. The very first thing I say is I, I do this all the time. So for people, I, 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 I talk to fellow actors, some of them who think Iago is motivated as Othello is motivated by jealousy, and then it's a play about jealousy. I don't happen to think so. Um, I don't think that's its main theme, and I certainly don't think that quality is shared in any major way by the two leading characters. Um, I think the, the first line of this tells you what the diagnosis is. He, this is I'm not, I'm not behaving this way just because... Uh, I hate the Moor. I'm not behaving this way just because Cassio was promoted. I do this kind of thing all the time. Thus do I ever make my fool my purse. I live off people all the time. I don't pay for anything. This is how I live. I live by taking advantage of idiots. That's what I do all the time, ever. And, I, and, the, and, and not only that, if I didn't do that, I would be profaning my knowledge that I've, which is hard won, hard gained knowledge. If I would time expend with such a snipe, but for my sport and profit. Now, here's an amazing thing. I don't know if you can show the audience the speech or not on the on the screen. I believe they have it in their chats. Great. So I believe they have access to it. If not, everybody, this is Act 1, Scene 3 of Othello, um, which you should be able to look up pretty quickly on Google if you'd like to, and please do follow along. But I mean, if you're looking at the verse in this line, quite regular. Thus do I ever make my fool my purse, for I mine own gain knowledge should profane, if I would time expend with such a snipe, but for my sport and profit, I hate the more. 
Now, what's extraordinary to me about that line, which I had a hell of a time wrapping my mind around at first until we had the right diagnosis for the character, was the fact that this single line, but for my sport and profit, I hate the Moor, is a single verse line. I've seen actors uh, almost choke themselves trying to get up the energy to say, I hate the Moor. I don't think that's what's written. I think it's it's absolutely cold as ice. And the, and the intention is, you see, it's a single verse line. Very simple, very regular. It's not even irregular. But for my sport and profit, I hate the moor. Simple, easy, just part of my life. Not the biggest part of my life, just part of my life single verse line. And taking that as a single verse line, to me, unlocked everything. One of the things that was really hard for me to wrap my mind around about psychopaths is they is the, the shallowness of affect, the lack of feeling in general. You think, well, if somebody's going to kill 30 women, he has mountains of rage in him. They have very little affect, very little emotion. So the coldness of that and, the, and the, therefore, the intention of the line, once again, is to disabuse the audience of everything they've seen up to this point. So I, I was lying all the time when I was pretending to be friends with this guy, Rodrigo. But let me clear one thing up. I was telling him I hate the Moor. That part is true. For I, my own gain, knowledge should profane if I would time expend with such a snipe, but for my sport and profit. I hate the Moor. Don't get me wrong about that. That part was true. Could you yeah. exp could you explain just a little bit? I'm sorry, just um, about the uh, sociopathy and the psychopathy. Um, I well, I'll, I'll speak as a lay person when it comes to this stuff. Is I'm not quite sure. I think there's one way of thinking about them in that they feel almost no emotion. Um, but you're saying that. So he's already, I think, by this time in the play, said that he doesn't understand love, which makes sense if he doesn't have empathy or compassion. Um, he feels hate, but it's not as deep as people seem to think it. And then, of course, later, as per the people you disagree with, and I agree with your disagreement about it being about jealousy, he does make an incredibly compelling and insightful... Um, well, the Green-Eyed Monster speech is a rather insightful look at an emotion that it would seem it would be difficult for a psychopath to gather up is there is that does that fit inside psychopathy and, and sociopathy that he would have that much insight into these deep feelings like jealousy if you look at what iago does what he does in almost every scene it, he's a magpie so he steal as soon as he hears uh cassio cassio has a whole thing where he excoriates himself he has a speech about reputation reputation i've lost my reputation Right. And he says, what are you talking about? It's nothing. Reputations, nothing. Um, he doesn't. Uh, and, and, but then in the next scene, he says. Um, uh, Good name in man or woman, dear my Lord, is the immediate jewel of our souls who steals my purse, steals trash to something, nothing to us. Mine tis his and has been slave to thousands. But he that filches from him my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed. He's just learned that in the previous scene. What, what a psychopath does is they mimic human behavior. They learn very, very early on that they don't feel the things that other people feel. But they notice, oh, people are crying at the funeral. I better learn how to cry at funerals. People seem to embrace each other when they part. Uh, they they have a moment of of trying to hold each other close. I better I better learn how to mimic that behavior, and they mimic behaviors as a, a as a raven or a, a, a crow does, and um, and so yes, I mean he's observed, absolutely observed jealousy. What he does understand to the root, to the very root and to the marrow of his bones is possessiveness. Now that's different than jealousy. Ted Bundy, for example, before he started killing women, he would just go into uh, 
a Kmart and steal a stereo and just walk out with it. And as a good looking six foot white man, he could do that. He would just pick up the stereo, walk out, put it in his car and drive away because he could. And he would do that kind of thing all the time. Um, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer uh, admitted when he, with the, with the young men that he killed, he tried to create zombies out of them. He would, he would um, drill into their heads and then pour in acid and see if he could keep them alive because what he really wanted was to possess the person. It's a terribly, terribly lonely condition. And, and he wanted to put, so the, the act of, for me, the act of possessing Othello as an object, as my object, uh, is something that I understand. And therefore the, the idea of possessing Emilia and of someone else cuckolding me, that I understand. And that's an injury that I cannot in any way, uh, look past it has Do you think it true does yago because i know this is uh jumping the gun slightly for the people everyone should take the opportunity to watch patrick page's one man show at any time that they can because it's an extraordinary um exploration into villainy in shakespeare but you said something really extraordinary in that to me which is that yago is perhaps the only character in the canon who does not tell the truth when he soliloquizes. Yeah, and I think I think he lies the whole time. But, but I I don't even know how much he knows. Uh, lying is is so reflexive. They said about Gary Ridgeway, the the Green River Killer. He when he was in his um, after he was already caught, and he was going to be. He knew that it was a death sentence. He'd already confessed. He would continue lying all the time. Same with Ted, Ted Bundy. It's reflexive. They just lie. It's just the way they are. They just live by lying. They like fucking with people's minds, but also I think it's reflexive. And um, so he lies to the audience all the time. Now in this scene, he says, um, and he doesn't say, I think, he says, it is thought abroad that twixt my sheets, he's done my office. And again, if you look at that verse line, it's quite extraordinary. He says, uh, and it is thought abroad that twixt my sheets, end of verse line, maybe a little pause, he's done my office. I know not if it be true. I don't even know. One verse line, he's done my office. I know not if it be true. So again, to me, that suggests in the writing of it, this doesn't go deep for him. It doesn't go deep for me as an actor, when I have to serve that verse line. And it is thought abroad that twixt my sheets. Now, the little pause at the end of that verse line to me is about, do I really want to tell you this? Because it reflects badly on me and I don't like things to reflect badly on me. And do you think, so is the idea then that um, if it's possessiveness, as opposed to jealousy, is the, the, the very problem is not that you think it, the problem is that other people are saying it. That's that right. That is mine. That's right, because that's a, that's an injury to my image. That's a narcissistic in, injury, right? What matters, I, know, I, I don't even know if it's true. If we were to put this in modern language, I'd say, I hate the more. And, you know, in, in, uh, I, 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 I heard in another country that people think he's fucking my wife. I don't even know if that's true, but it doesn't matter because I'm going to I'm going to behave as if, it, as if it it it's true. I, I even if I suspect it, I'm going to even if others suspect it, I'm going to treat it. It was very helpful for me to read Gordon Liddy's book Will because you know, he spent time in prison after the Watergate after he was convicted in the Watergate scandal. And for me it's always important as an actor, to know precisely who I'm talking to. And the audience could be anybody. If I'm talking to, for example, my therapist, my psychotherapist, I talk to him differently than I talk to my wife. I may have exactly the same speech. It's going to come out differently depending on who the target is. If I'm telling my mother the same speech, is going to come out differently, right? So the target, who you're talking to, unbelievably important. For me, I found that target in Gordon Liddy's book. For me, the target is fellow uh, potential recruits 
or fellow, or uh, what in my mind, fellow prisoners. So while Gordon Liddy was in prison, what he wanted, he wanted all the other prisoners to know not to fuck with him. Don't fuck with me. I know that I don't look that tough. I know I'm kind of a scrawny, middle-aged white guy, and you could probably beat the shit out of me. But all of these speeches project a kind of defiance. So I don't even know if it's true, but I, I for mere suspicion in that kind, will do as if for sure. He holds me well, the better shall my purpose work on him. And then he begins a new beat. And when you, the new beat, you see that there's an inverted foot at the beginning of this. If you don't know uh, prosody very well, if you don't, if you don't understand versification very well, that's fine. All you have to see is that uh, the line should begin da dum, the better will do. But I, those all begin da dum, da dum, da dum. This line begins Cassio's. It be goes da dum da, dum da, and except for the first line, thus, it's the first line that does that. It's the first line since the beginning of the speech with an inverted foot. And there's something about the, the K sound. Cassio's a proper man. There's just a little contempt in that motherfucker. Cassio's a proper man. Let me see now. And then this next line is quite remarkable. To get his place and to plume up my will. It's remarkable for a couple of reasons. One, it's all monosyllables. It's all single syllable words. If you think that's easy to do, try writing it sometimes. It's not easy to do. And when Shakespeare writes all monosyllables, the character's honing down on something. It's very difficult to take monosyllables quickly. If you say, um, to get his place and to plume up my will, impossible. You have to slow down. It's like you see a sign at the side of the road that says slow. And that's exactly what the mind is doing at that point, to get his place and to plume up my will. What does that mean? That's an extraordinary image. You have to notice there's been no, there's been no imagery in this speech. There's been no metaphor, no simile, no consonance, no assonance, no um, alliteration. All of a sudden, we have this image to plume up my will. Will, of course, in Elizabethan parlance, is a reference to a sexual organ, both male and female, but usually male, right? So to plume up and, and to plume something up is to, 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 to give it pride, to make it show, to put a plume on a hat, but it's, it's also the image of an erection here. And, and um, these, the, the psychopathy, all of these people that I studied, these were all sexual crimes in the case of Dahmer, in the case of Raider, in the case of Bundy, in the case of Ridgeway, they're always sexual crimes. And there's a sexual component to everything Iago does. But really, this is as close as he gets, I think, to admitting his real motive, which is, I just want to feel more powerful. I want to plume up my will. Yeah, I want to get his place. That'd be great. I want to be, but that'd be good. But now to plume up my will, double knavery. Whoo! How, how, let me see. Amazing piece of uh, kind of naturalistic writing there. Patrick, can I actually ask, and it may be, you may have just answered it with the naturalistic writing, but since we are, um, and I'm, I'm so glad we are getting it, uh, into into verse work, because um, we don't often get to dig that deep, but for people who are following along, and, and you describe how iambic pentameter works, um, the way that you were just stressing that line uh, is almost the exact inverse of a strong onset iambic pentameter, so trochee and four iams, you almost, you did that one almost perfectly as an iam and four trochees. Uh, you stressed his and plume and then my will. Um, yeah, I mean, I think people get possible? a little, I think people get a little in their heads about mm -hmm. pentameter. The, the important thing about a line of pentameter is the five strong stresses. Now, this line, for example, to get his place and to plume up my will is 10 perfect syllables, but that's rare. Very frequently there's an elision in the middle of the line um, or words are crushed somehow. What's really important is that the five strong syllables and the five 
strong syllables in this line are to get, place, plume, will. That's four. And then to get his place and to plume up my will in double knavery, right? And, really, yeah, you chose his the last couple of times. Which I, makes could, sense. I, I could argue that this is almost a completely stressed line. I could argue for to get his place and to plume up my will. I could argue for a, a really overstressed line. But I think the main thing is, and, and, and again, this is what we're talking about always when we're talking about verse is tendencies of the verse, not rules of the verse. I think if you start talking about rules of the verse, you get into a kind of dogmatic way of approaching the text, which leads to lifelessness. And what we're always looking for is more life instead of less life. So I'm talking about tendencies of the verse. A, a verse line wants to be regular. That's its tendency. Now, when it absolutely won't conform, we have to ask why. Um, this line, this next line won't conform. Impossible to say Cassio is a proper man, right? It has to go Cassio is a proper man. So as an actor, I have to ask myself, what's that about? And for me, it's just like, it's like when, you, when you're testing a tire and you push that little button and just that little bit of air comes out. You're seeing the pressure that's inside there. Cassio's a proper man. Just that little contempt for Cassio, that little bit of air that comes out. Let me see now. To get his place and to plume up my will in double knavery. How? How? Let me see. And then this thing, this is almost too easy, right? After some time to abuse Othello's ear that he is too familiar with his wife, that's the oldest trick in the book. That's almost stupid for me to even consider something that simple. But unbelievably regular line. He hath a person and a smooth dispose to be suspected, and now this won't conform, framed to make women false. So again, in framed, there's something framed. To, and, and you may notice that once again, that's as close to an image as we get. We had a little bit of an image, a little bit of a metaphor on plume up my will, and now we have a little bit of a metaphor on framed. And now once again, quite regular, the moor is of a free and open nature. Completely regular line. It has a feminine ending, but feminine ending, that little syllable that drops off at the end, to be or not to be, that is the question. That little syllable that drops off at the end is, is a, it's a convention. It's, it's a, the ear doesn't hear it. And, and this, is a, this is an oral poetry, not a written poetry. Um, that thinks men honest, that but seem to be so, and will as tenderly be led by the nose as asses are, and then you have the rest of the line blank. So for the first time, he pauses. Every, every one of these lines, you see his mind working through the center of the line, but for my sport and profit, I hate the more. Mind moving forward, right? Um, will do as if for surety he holds me well. Mind moving forward in double knavery. How, how, let's see. Mind moving forward. But now we get, and will is tenderly be led by the nose as asses are, and the rest of the line is silence. Stop for the first time. Pause. I have it. No, I don't quite have it. It is engendered. I'm pregnant with something. It's engendered. I'm pregnant with something that's not fully formed yet. Hell and night have to bring it to its full fruition. I'm not going to be the only steward of this idea. Hell and night must bring this monstrous birth to the world's light. And suddenly we have not just uh, a rhyming couplet, which is to me a kind of, first of all, I, 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 for me, 
if there's a couplet, if the if the character rhymes, that's my I'm rhyming. Yago's rhyming. Shakespeare's not rhyming. I and, and that's the case with all of the verse. The verse is my creation, Iago's creation, not Shakespeare's creation. So this couplet is my creation and it has an intention. And the intention is for you to come along with me. The intention is to show I am completely in control to the point that I can even rhyme. And in the last line is this extraordinary image in a speech which has been almost completely devoid of image. Hell and night must bring this monstrous birth. Imagine a monstrous birth, a woman giving birth, and out comes this monster, this deformed, horrible thing. Hell and night are going to be its midwives, and they're going to help me bring this forth. And you know, so many of these men who've done this, who are psychopathic, have said they felt a connection to Satan, to Lucifer, to hell. Dennis Rader says, the only explanation I have for it is demonic. Um, uh, David Berkowitz um, said, I, absolutely, I was possessed. And uh, um, Ted Bundy said, absolutely, I was possessed, and it would build up in me, something came over me. So you can believe that or not believe in that. What's important is the people who commit these crimes believe it. And Iago is aligning himself with that at this point. At the end of the play, after his villainy is revealed, Othello says, after he, he, everything, he, everything's come out, he says, I look down at his feet, but that's a fable. And then he says, if thou beast a devil... I cannot kill thee, and he stabs him. Well, what is he looking down for? He's looking down at the feet for hooves. If, if, if I'm, I look down at his feet to see if you have hooves instead of feet. And then he says, but that's a fable. But let me see, just in case, if you are a devil, I can't kill you. And he stabs him. And then Shakespeare, in this marvelous ambiguity, has Iago say, I bleed, sir but not killed. So it, he leaves it up in the air as if uh, 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 the, the question of the demonic. Um, Patrick, can I, 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 I just want to ask you uh, to reiterate something you said right there at the end, because uh, it was something you said to me a number of years ago. I'm not even sure if you remember saying it, but I actually think it's perhaps the important note for approaching Shakespeare um, you talked about it a little bit. The way you worded it to me was something along the lines of Shakespeare characters don't speak Shakespeare, they speak English. And um, could you just, uh, you've said it once, but could you expound on it again? Because I really do think it's essential to what we do. Yeah, I mean, as I say, this speech is, is pretty much devoid of imagery. But let's take a speech that has a lot of imagery, right? If, if Othello says, oh, now... Farewell, the tranquil mind. Farewell, con content. Farewell, the plumed troop. And the big wars that make ambition virtue. Oh, farewell. When a character moves into... If, if Juliet says, uh, my love is... Oh, I'm missing a word now. My love is as something as the sea. Well, let's take the first line of Twelfth Night, for example. If music be the food of love... Play on, give me excess of it, that surfeiting the appetite may sicken and so die. There's a lot of imagery in that. First, it starts with a question. If music be the food of love, play on, give me excess of it, that surfeiting, in other words, becoming full of it, the appetite, my appetite for Olivia, will sicken and so die, right? That's... A character, we use metaphor and simile and other types of heightened speech in life precisely as Shakespeare's characters use them. So if I'm having, if I really want you to understand something and I want you to understand it, I want you to experience it. I want you to experience it emotionally. And I might say to you, 
You know, my mother, she's, she has a kind of fragility about her. She's like, she's like one of those baby birds that you can almost see, you can see the, the inner part of, you can see through them. And they're all mouth, they're all appetite, right? If I use that kind of imagery, what am I doing? I'm, try, I, I'm trying to get you closer to my experience of my mother because you haven't met her. So if Ina Barbas says, the barge she sat on, like a burnished throne burned on the water, the poop was beaten gold, purple the sails, and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. That's him trying to bring you close. That's not just the way people in Shakespeare talk. That's Ina Barbas trying to make to, to give you a sensory experience of what it was like to be on the barge with the Queen of Egypt. The poop was beaten gold. The oars were silver. Those are all just descriptions, but there are, there are tons of image, image, image. He takes you there through the imagery. Hell and night must bring this. Now, what is that for an actor? The actor has to create the image. The actor's not repeating something that exists. The actor must create that image. So, um, Macbeth, for example, is full of imagery. He says, um, besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculty so meek, hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead, and here's a simile, like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. Okay, that's, that's, what, that's how, what it's going to be like. And pity. This is another uh, thing that Shakespeare does a lot, which is to personify images, themes, emotions, things like time, fortune, pity. Pity is personified in this case. And pity, like, like what? Like, 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 well, what's on his mind? What's on his mind is that Lady Macbeth and he have lost a child. Maybe, maybe they even had to take that child out. Maybe the child was born uh, in some way disabled, in a way that one couldn't keep a child in this period of time. And maybe they had to expose the child to the elements, which was the way you got rid of children in that time. And he says, and pity, like, like what? Like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim. The one image leads to the next, a human baby exposed to the elements, striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim, horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air shall blow the horrid deed in every eye, the tears will drown the wind. Now, horsed is in his mind, right? horsed upon the sightless carriers of the air. So then he says, I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, as you would spur a horse, but only vaulting ambition, as you would vault a horse over a vault, which or leaps itself and falls on the other as a horse that's fallen short. Now, unless you have that in your mind, you're just saying words. You're not acting. You have to have seen the image in order to say the image. And you have to see it as you say it. So that's how imagery, that's how metaphor, simile works in Shakespeare. And, and what I'm pointing out here is with, with this couplet, I believe that's how rhyme works as well. Um, that's how stichomythia works. For example, in the scenes between Kate and Petruchio and Richard and Anne, they're completely aware of the rhythmic way in which they're speaking with each other and the fact that the game is, I take your word, I use it in my sentence in a better way than you can use it, and we do that until somebody wins. And they do that in Romeo and Juliet as well. The boys do at the beginning. 
Richard and Anne too. Richard and Anne. And it's a game. And, and it's a way of, it's a dominance game. And it's about who wins. And, right. and it's conscious. You see, it's not, it's not us, it's not Shakespeare doing it. It's Romeo and Benvolio doing it. It's Richard and Anne doing it. It's Macbeth doing it. It's, and therefore, it's Iago doing it. And therefore, it's Patrick doing it. And if Patrick doesn't do it, then there's no life. Then we might as well all stay home. Um, well, thank you, thank you, Patrick. Uh, it was good for me to hear it again too. But um, and and I wanted to take that extra five minutes because I really do. The first time you said that to me, I was like, that may be the most important thing I've ever heard about Shakespeare. So thank you for reiterating it. Thank um, you. We do have a couple of. Questions. I, I I must say that's oh. not. This is this I learned from John Barton, who is the great Shakespeare guru, at um, the RSC, and. In the early 90s, uh, they created a group of actors at the public theater, of which I was one, led by Kevin Klein. And they brought in John Barton to, they, they had the notion of creating a core Shakespeare company who would be trained um, by Barton. And, and for me, that was the main takeaway of Barton's teaching. Thank you. Yeah, and that's we we had um, Lisa Harrow on earlier, who of course was part of that original training program that John Barton did, the playing Shakespeare. Um, that's cool to go full circle here. Um, we do have a couple of people who wrote in some questions, um, and we've invited a couple of them on. These are broader questions uh, than than the work we just did, um, but I would love to have Ali join. Uh, with a question about villain, you playing so many villains as you do. Hi, Ali. How are you? Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. So you are known for playing such intimidating, villainous characters um, in your work. How do you find such empathy for those characters and get the audience to really engage with you? Thank you for asking that. I think it's so important. It's not, it's not only important for actors, although it's, it's deeply important for actors. It's just important for human beings. Um, I tell you what, I, was, I, I, I knew I was going to do this tonight, and so while we were in the 10 minutes or so before we started this, I pulled out my rehearsal journal from... Uh, from this time period, and I, I, of course, I've forgotten almost everything that I've written in it. But uh, I was, I was struck with something that I wrote about Iago. Part of, part of what I'm doing as Iago, I wrote, is to understand myself, my experiment. Most of these men, they would talk about Bundy, Raider. They would talk about their projects. They were projects that they were proud of. So how far can a human being be pushed before he becomes absolutely bestial, before he returns to a beast? So what do I love about Iago? I love his curiosity. I love his will to, to survive. Um, he's had this narcissistic injury, which is existential for him. It, he, he can't survive it. He can't survive the new image of himself, which is that he is not on top of the game, that he's not worthy of being promoted, that he's not worthy of being Othello's best friend. And there's deep, deep shame associated with that. So I love his will to, to survive. I love his devotion to and care for himself. And then I wrote, this is why I've always suspected he was an orphan and or abused. He's decided to take care of himself when no one else will. He believes this. So I found empathy for him in that way. I believe Iago is probably the most difficult character I've ever had to find empathy for. In a character, I, for example, Shylock I play in, in my one-man show, easy peasy, right? He was spit on, he was kicked. It's finally his chance. The law is on his side. He's going to use it. You know, Edmund in Lear, 
he's a bastard. You watch his father treat him like, uh, like um, almost invisible in the first scene. Kent has to say to him, is not this your son, my lord? He's going to walk right past him, mm -hmm. right? The fact that Edmund wants to grab what he can, I, I, I have a great deal of empathy for that. Um, a lot of it also is about choosing the right super objective for the character, the super objective being what the character wants most in the entire play. So, for example, a character like Hades, if I were to say that my super objective is to dominate and to be uh, revered as the ruler of Hades town, I would be quite an unsympathetic character. But in fact, my super objective for that play is to regain the love of Persephone. And everything I do, including building the wall, including abusing Orpheus, are ways that I think will impress her. Of course, I'm completely wrong about that, but the, the intention is to win her back. Yeah, and that comes through having seen Hades Town. So that's the way with every character, it's finding, um, a way in, finding a mutuality, finding the part that I say, oh yes, I understand that. I could see how I could behave that way. So I created for myself with Iago a backstory that I thought, well, if that had happened to me, I, I very much see that I could behave in this way. Thank you, Ali. Thank, Thank you for you. the question. Um, and thank you, Patrick, for such an insightful answer. I think we'll jump right to the next one. Um, they're related and yet not. This is Bree, who has a question about soliloquies. Hi, uh, hey. I'm Bree, obviously. Hello, nice to meet you. Um, so my question, yeah, it's like very much different, but also kind of related. Um, so soliloquies are like crucial to the plot of Othello and like Iago has seven, which is so many, like as an actor, I don't know if I can memorize that many. So props to you for that. Um, and they aren't the hard <laughs> ones. The, the, really? the, the hard speech, the, the, the almost impossible speech is the put money in thy purse speech. I, 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 I don't know that I ever got it right. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I can only imagine like, again, like as an actor, that must be so like, for me, it would be really nerve wracking and kind of anxiety inducing. And I know like you're very open about your mental health, which is very inspiring as someone who also has some of the same issues trying to go into theater. And so I was wondering like, what did you do in order to like calm any nerves or anxiety that you had or for any other people, if they did happen to have any of the same nerves, like what would your advice be? Well, I, I find that to meditate for at least a half hour before the show, I used to, when I was younger, I remember I was doing Richard III at the Utah Shakespeare Festival. And I, I felt that I had to, in order to calm my nerves, I had to run all the lines before the show. Well, it's a three and a half hour play and Richard has two thirds of the lines. So it would take me over two hours and I would go into this dance studio and I would run all the lines. And so of course what the audience got was my second take. Um, I learned later to trust myself more and to now I will sit and meditate in silence and clear my mind so that new things can enter it during the show. That's one thing I do. The other thing I do is part of a spiritual practice, which is because of my belief in a higher power, I simply say, I am not up to this tonight, but I know you can probably do this. So will you please give me a hand? Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you. For, thank you for joining, Bree. Um, I think we have, Patrick, we've gone a little bit um, long because you're amazing. Uh, can you take a question or two from the chat? Sure. Great. Uh, Jessica, do we have any from uh, YouTube or Facebook that we would want to toss on? Possibly. There we go. Uh, here, I'll read this one out. So Michael Crowley asks, uh, Yako tells the audience how he's going to manipulate people, then he does it, like Richard III. Do you think Shakespeare took some of the traits he explored in Richard III and pushed them further in Yago? Any connection there? Absolutely, yes. Good observation. Um, very, very much so. 
their cousins. And Richard's kind of an early draft. Um, the the, the um, experiment with conscience, for example, he tries in conscience is, a, is one of the themes of Richard III. And, um, you know, uh, Richard says in his, in his battlefield speech, he says, conscience is but a word that cowards use to keep the strong in awe. And I think a lot of um, dictators and, and authoritarians have, have really believed that. Um, uh, and then Shakespeare, there's this really quite extraordinary experimental speech in the fifth act where uh, Richard is afflicted by conscience. And the speech doesn't quite, to my mind, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing work of a 26-year-old playwright who's really only written a handful of plays before, and he's going really deeply into the human condition. Because conscience, which he'll later explore in, in full in Hamlet, where it, it's the theme, conscience, consciousness, what makes us human. Consciousness and conscience glossed as the same word in Shakespeare's time. So when Hamlet says, um, conscience does make cowards of us all, he's saying consciousness, our ability to look forward, to, to, to weigh the rights and wrongs, to look forward and back, to imagine the consequences, to imagine death, that's what, that's what keeps us from acting. Um, yes, and both Richard and Iago are based on the tradition that Shakespeare would have seen as a child, which is the tradition of a character called the vice in medieval morality plays. And the vice was a character who wasn't human at all, but was rather a kind of embodied sin, like, um, envy, pride, covetousness. Uh, and that character was the character in the play that got to speak and play directly to the audience, therefore was an extremely popular, popular character, both to play, actors wanted to play it, and audiences loved that character. He was funny, so audiences loved that. He, he was the introduction of anarchy. He's the introduction of chaos into the order of the play, because that's what plays are, right? Plays start in some kind of order, and then anarchy, chaos, is introduced. And so the character who introduces the chaos is the necessary engine of the play. Uh, and it was amazing in Richard III, for example, to say, for Shakespeare to say, I'm going to make the engine the main, the main thing. Um, you're, um, the engine all, is all there is. Someone once asked me, they said, I've been offered Buckingham in, in Richard III. Should I play it? And I said, well, Buckingham is a wonderful part if it weren't in Richard III. But there's only one part worth playing in Richard III, and that's Richard III, because he wipes everybody else off the stage. The, the, the character is so charismatic. Um, and um, that's the danger of Iago, too, of course. There, it's, been, it's too often that the play becomes about Iago, and, and, and you don't know why it's called Othello, when in fact the play is about Othello. And Iago is the antagonist. So yeah, they're they're cousins. Thanks and thanks, Michael. Uh, and good day. I'm glad you're you're glad you're watching. It was good to see you the other day. Uh, Jessica, do we have any others? There we go. Um, SS Project Two One Three um, asks. I'm interested in whether you have any thoughts on the interpretation of queerness in Iago, either in text or in performances. Do you kind do you find that conversation interesting at all? I do. Um, in point of fact, that's how I, that's what I played the first time I played him in 1988, I guess. I don't know that I ever shared that with the director, but I played very much that uh, I was jealous, that I was a jilted lover. Not that I, not that my love had ever been reciprocated or, or, or consummated with Othello, but that I was deeply romantically sexually in love with Othello. Um, that's a theory, incidentally, that was introduced by Dr. Ernest Jones and about the play. And um, Laurence Olivier was a great devotee of Jones. And the film that Olivier made of Othello is almost entirely based on Jones' theory, um, Oedipal 
reading of Hamlet. Um, so you see the, the, the opening of Olivier's Hamlet starts in the mother's bedroom and then the camera pans out and goes down to the other room. You say, well, he didn't show you that bed for nothing, right? Um, he, he very much believed in an Oedipal reading of Hamlet and he believed in the uh, queer reading. Olivier believed in the queer reading of, uh, of Iago and <laughs> there's a wonderful story about uh, him being in rehearsal, Ralph Richardson was playing Othello. And at one point during rehearsal, Olivier took him and kissed him full on the mouth. And Richardson just backed off and said, oh, dear boy, dear boy, dear, dear boy, <laughs> and walked away. Um, but he played it that way. And indeed, I played it that way. And and what I can tell you is it didn't, it didn't serve the play. When, when you find the right way in, Every line, every scene will seem inevitable. You will simply say, oh, yes, of course, this must be it. And that's what I found when the diagnosis was sociopathy, when the diagnosis was homosexuality, which I was also dealing with in my personal life because my father had just come out. So it may not have been the best time for me to be using that in my work. Maybe I could... Maybe I could use it again today and it would be different. But I was I was wrestling with that, not, not because I had any problem with it, but because he had decided to stay married with my mother. My mother and my father had decided to stay together. And I was a young person and I, and I was having trouble understanding that arrangement. Um, but for me, when I played it that way, it, 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 didn't, it didn't work. It didn't serve the play. Um, thanks, Patrick. I'm actually going to, if you don't mind me asking a follow up there. Um, there is, it seems to me that there is a balance between drawing from things that matter to you personally at a time and being a positive and being something that can actually make it difficult to perform. I mean, you just you just brought up the example you did and, and used that as an example of it, perhaps actually inhibiting you being able to do that. Um, but of course, we also hear all the time about actors drawing on their own experiences. Do you, do you have any kind of clarification, at least from your own point of view of... Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I run an acting studio, so I deal with this a lot. Um, I certainly don't subscribe to the trend that people should only play the things that they've experienced themselves. Um, I don't think I need to be Italian to play or Spanish or whatever he is to play Iago. Uh, I don't think I need to be a sociopath to play Iago. I, I did a year of study so, to understand that. Um, I don't think I need to be Danish to play Hamlet. And I don't think I need to be disabled to play Richard III. Um, now, there's also the question of representation. So if a disabled actor is available and fantastic, then absolutely, I think the, the question of representation is a separate question. And we need to see representation on stage. You know, I grew up not seeing very many actors of color on the stage. So, and if I had been a person of color, that would have discouraged me from going into, uh, from, from following my, my heart's desire. But because I saw people like me up on the stage, I thought, well, maybe I can do that, right? So representation is hugely important. But on the question of character acting, of what someone can play, I believe an actor can play almost anything. Um, the best Lady Bracknell I've seen was Brian Be Bedford's. Um, uh, and... And, and in that case, it was just fine. I mean, because he was, I mean, the, the way that that particular production of Importance of Being Earnest got financed was because Brian Bedford wanted to play Lady Bracknell, right? So it's always a question. There are, there are questions. There's question of casting. There's question of representation. Um, uh, tell me your question again so I make sure I'm addressing it. Absolutely. So it's about the sort of emotional engagement. Ah, oh, emotional, yes, thank you. Yeah. There are things, let's say your mother, God forbid, 
was just killed in a car crash. And you have to go out and play a scene about losing your mother. Too soon. That's not, that's not, you won't get your best work. You're in the middle of a trauma. Um, you, you won't, what, what your body will do, my experience is one of two things will happen. As I train actors, I see this and I observe it in my own life. One of two things will happen. Either your emotions will shut down entirely to try to protect you from the trauma and you won't be able to reach anything on stage or your emotions will be so out of control that you, you won't hear the play that it will become about your personal trauma and not about what's happening with the character at that moment. So you do have to process things before they can be used in your work. I think that's, uh, you know, there's a, there's the story of Daniel day Lewis having to leave the stage. His father had recently died. His father was quite a famous man. He had been poet laureate of England and he had um, a very, uh, intense and complicated relationship with his father. And then he was playing Hamlet and he had to leave the stage during the scene with the, uh, the ghost of his father and he, and he never returned to the role. Um, and indeed he never returned to the stage. Um, and that's a case of where, you know, something's too close and that's happened to me before. It happened to me when I was playing Claudius for theater for a new audience and what the character was experiencing and what I was experiencing were too close and I had a breakdown and I wasn't able to continue with the show and I had to be replaced. So I, I, I've kind of learned my lesson with that. Uh, I appreciate you. I appreciate you answering that as, uh, as you did. Um, I have already taken more time than I said I would of your time. Uh, I'm, I so appreciate you coming in. That really is all the time we have tonight. Um, thank you, everybody who listened for tuning in to this remarkable conversation. And Patrick, thank you for joining me this evening. Uh, you, I'm actually not sure you've mentioned it, but you have a podcast of your own that people oh, thank can tune you. into. Correct? Yeah, that's so nice of you to bring that up. Yeah, please, if you'd like to join me. Uh, we're, we just today dropped the first episode of our second season. So we we did our first season, and there are 22 episodes of that. It's available on Apple Podcasts, on all, all the different streaming networks, any streaming network that, that does podcasts, you'll find us. I think you can also find uh, the first season or at least much of the first season on YouTube. Um, and then we just started the the second season today, and I, I really, so far, I'm I'm really pleased with the second season. And I was pleased with the first season, but I feel like we've really, really hit our stride. And what is it? What is it called? Just oh, for it's called the Patrick Page Podcast. There we go. So everybody, please do check out the Patrick Page Podcast. I have listened to, uh, I think I'm three episodes into the first season, so I'm behind, but it is absolutely worth it. So do check all of that out. Patrick, thank you again for coming. It has been a true pleasure. I'm going to pitch a couple of things now, and I won't make you stick around for it. Thank you. And I, I just want to say, you know, thank you for the work you're doing uh for red bull thank you to jesse um it's so important now i mean i think you can see as we go through this speech the depth of the material this is our birthright this is our heritage and this is as as english speaking people right english speaking people of all races of all genders of all um uh, sexual orientations, uh, all gender orientations. It's, it's ours because we speak English, because English is our native language. This is our heritage. And it is one of the greatest gifts that has ever been given to any people on the face of the earth. And, and when you um, go deeply into these plays, they will, they will bring meaning into your life. And so, a group like Red Bull that has as its mission keeping these plays alive because they're plays. They have to be played in a space by actors. You can't just sit down and read them. That's like sitting down and looking at the blueprint of a cathedral. It's not a cathedral. It's a blueprint. It's like sitting down and trying to read Beethoven's Fifth. That's nonsense. 
They have to be played, and that's what Red Bull is doing. So thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Jesse. And please give, if you can afford to give to them, please, please do, because it helps actors like me uh, when I perform in these to keep to keep these things alive. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, uh, as many of you probably know, this is actually part of a month of exploration of Othello that we've called Othello 2020. There are a number of upcoming events. Um, I'm going to be reading them, so I apologize for it not uh, to not be speaking directly at you, but. Um, Please do check out every Wednesday of October, starting this upcoming one from 1.30 to 3 o'clock. We're going to have a seminar series of uh, Exploring Othello in 2020, where renowned Shakespeare scholar Ayanna Thompson and an entirely BIPOC panel of actors, playwrights, and directors will discuss Othello and its relationship to the world in which we live today. So that'll be going for all of the Wednesdays of October. And then a week from today, Keith Hamilton Cobb and his brilliant play American Moor, which Red Bull Theater produced last year, will return for an informal reading that you can see both on the Red Bull YouTube page and the Facebook page and Red Bull Theater's website. And then the following week after that, we will be doing another reading of a new play, Keen, by and truly Felicia King in association with the American Shakespeare Center. And Keen is a, and I quote, heartfelt ode to always being the second class genius of color. Keen is a playful riff on early career academia, Shakespeare's Othello, and the power of American pop. Finally, to not nearly as eloquently um, repeat what Patrick has said, all of our fall 2020 programs are completely free, uh, but this is only possible through the support of people like you please consider making a tax-deductible donation today to support Red Bull Theatre and invest in the vitality of classical theatre for a contemporary audience. We're committed to continuing connection during this historic time, and your support helps make that possible. Once more, thank you all. This has been Red Bull Theatre's Remarkable Podversations. I'm your host, Nathan Winkelstein. We end, sort of fittingly, with Iago. Demand me nothing. What you know, you know. Good night.